Next, let's look at some schedules, and we'll interleave locking into the schedules and see how it affects things. In this first schedule, it's a non-two-phase locking schedule. We're starting out with two bank accounts, A and B. A has $1,000 and B has $2,000. And then we're going to have a print statement in transaction two to print out some stuff about the sum of the uh, two accounts. Okay. So in T1, we start by getting an exclusive lock on A. Okay. And then we do a read of A and we see 1,000. T2 comes along and tries to get a shared lock on A, but has to wait for T1. T1 continues then, subtracting 50 from A in memory, and then writing that A to disk. So now on disk, A is 950, and T1 unlocks A. T2 can now make progress, so T2 is scheduled, and it reads from A, and it sees the value 950, and then it unlocks A. Now, the next thing T2 does is it tries to get a shared lock on B, which is a non-two-phase locking behavior, because it already did an unlock, right? So this is not an official two-phase locking schedule. This is breaking the rules, okay? So B would like to get a shared lock on B, and it succeeds, okay? Meanwhile, T1 is scheduled. It tries to get an exclusive lock on B, which is not compatible with T2's shared lock. So T1's going to have to wait. T2 goes ahead and reads B and sees 2,000, unlocks B, and prints A, B, and A plus B. And the values of A, B, and A plus B at this point, A is 950, B is 2,000, and the sum is 2,950. Somehow, at least from T2's point of view, we've lost $50. Meanwhile, by unlocking B, T1 can continue. It reads B, it sees 2,000. It adds 50 to make it 2050. And it writes B, and B is 2050. The next schedule is a two-phase locking schedule. Not a strict two-phase locking schedule, just a regular two-phase locking schedule. Here we start with T1 getting an X lock on A. All right, and it does a read of A, it subtracts 50 in memory, and then it does a write back to the database. Then it goes ahead and it acquires an exclusive lock on B. And its lock acquisition phase is now done. It does its first unlock of A. Okay. Now, T2 is scheduled, asks for a shared lock on A, and gets it. Does the read on A, sees 950. Meanwhile, T1 runs again, reads B, sees 2000, adds 50 to B, and writes it back to the database for 2050, and unlocks B. T2 now can request and get a shared lock on B, because T1 has unlocked it. T2 unlocks A which is okay, because this is two-phase locking, not strict two-phase locking. It reads B, it sees 2050, and then it unlocks B and prints out the final result, and the output this time is 950, 2050, and 3000. And as you'd hope, um, T2's uh, output is conflict equivalent to running T1 before T2. Two-phase locking gives us that effect. Finally, here's a strict two-phase locking schedule. T1 locks A, does the read, T2 requests a shared lock on A, but can't get it because it's incompatible with T1's exclusive lock. T1 then uh, subtracts 50 from A, does the write, goes and gets an exclusive lock on B, does a read of B, uh, adds 50 in memory, and then does the write, and then simultaneously unlocks A and B. And now T2 can go and get its lock on A. It does so, it requests another lock on B, it does its read on B, and it does its print. It sees the out effects of T1, okay, and then it atomically unlocks both A1, uh, A and B, uh, ending the strict two-phase locking protocol. Again, this gives us a conflict serial schedule. Now, which schedules does strict two-phase locking allow? You might hope that it would allow all the conflict serializable schedules, but it doesn't. Here's a little Venn diagram of schedules and what's possible with different um, definitions that we've seen so far. So there's all the possible schedules for a set of transactions, and that's the outermost blob here. Within the all schedules, there's a subset of schedules that are serializable. And within the serializable schedules, we've been defining subsets of that that we can test for. There's the conflict serializable schedules, and we said that those are a subset of the view serializable schedules, which are more permissive. They allow uh, for blind writes uh, to be uh, overwriting things that would otherwise conflict, right? Now, there's also the schedules that avoid cascading aborts. And we said we wanted schedules that were conflict serializable and avoided cascading aborts. And so that's this pink square in the middle. And that's roughly what we get out of strict 2PL, is the pink square. It's some subset of the overlap between the avoids cascading abort schedules and the conflict serializable schedules. And of course, within this pink strict 2PL, there's also the serial schedules that are, of course, conflict serializable and avoid cascading aborts. 
So hopefully this Venn diagram makes sense. You can um, convince yourself about its different pairwise containments or pairwise non-containments uh, if you want to sort of test yourself in terms of your understanding of these different definitions.